welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Matt Parker. He is a part of Railroad Workers United, and he's been here before. Matt, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you for having me back, Sabrina. It's good to be here with you again. Awesome. Okay, so Matt, um, last time you were here, it was because at that point in time, you guys were talking about going on strike. Uh, and there was the situation with Congress not approving the seven day sick days. But since then, other things have happened. And I almost feel like the situation that's happening in East Palestine is almost like karma uh, in a sense, because I'm sure, if, as you have heard, uh, there was a train that did derail in East Palestine, Ohio. And that train was carrying chemicals that were released into the air and apparently also the water uh, system there in East Palestine. So the residents are now experiencing uh, symptoms such as headaches, runny nose. Uh, they're having issues with their sight as well. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear from you because I do know one of the, the issues that the railroad workers were pushing back against were the safety issues and the safety concerns. When you look back at this situation that happened in East Palestine, Ohio, do you feel like this could have been prevented? And what else do you think should have been done? If you watch the media briefing that was held by the National Transportation Safety Board on the day that they released their preliminary report, uh, Chair Hammondy, Chair Chipper Hammondy, made this, this accident, like all other accidents, was preventable. Uh, what it comes down to is how much effort are you going to put in to savings, to oversight, to doing what you can to to make sure uh, that the that these trains run safety. So could could this accident have been prevented? I, I would agree with Chip. Could have. Uh, how that's going to be revealed through the course of the investigation in their final report. Mm. I have a clip here because this was released recently that now it's not just the residents of East Palestine, Ohio, that are having uh, illness. It's also some of the railroad workers that are also experiencing an illness as well. So I want to play this clip here from Case Study QB. So shout out to Case for capturing this. And I'll go ahead and bring in uh, Mary Lee as well. Let's go ahead and introduce Mary Lee. Mary Lee is back as well. She's also, she was a railroad worker as well. We're just getting into the situation that happened in uh, East Palestine, Ohio, Mary Lee. Okay. Thank so you here we go. Meanwhile, leaders of 12 railroad unions, they met with Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg yesterday to address the derailment and safety improvements. Now, the same day, the Teamsters sent a letter to the secretary and the governor of Ohio. They say that Norfolk Southern put its workers at risk by not providing protective equipment. Days after the derailment, several railroad employees reported experiencing symptoms. And CNN has reached out to Norfolk Southern for comment on that letter. But for now, let's talk to Tony Cardwell. He's the general president of the Union Brotherhood of Maintenance of Ways Employees Division. Uh, Tony, thank you for your time. First, talk to me about these symptoms. Are your members experiencing them and what are they? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Victor. Yeah, our members are uh, experiencing the symptoms, uh, headaches, uh, eye irritation, throat irritation, skin irritation, nausea, sickness. Um, they were um, put on scene shortly after the derailment and had been working on that scene for uh, quite a while after fixing and repairing the track. That's what our members do. They fix and repair and rebuild track. And ultimately, uh, they were put on scene and, and, and had, did, were not provided, the were being told they were not provided the proper uh, personal protective equipment. They were working out there in street clothes and leather boots and leather shoes. And obviously, those are not uh, appropriate barriers uh, for the contaminants that were on the ground. And they Mary Lee, I want to bring you in really quick. I have a question in reference to the railroad workers not being provided PPE. Does that sound normal to you? Because I know, obviously, this isn't the first time that a train has derailed. But does that sound like typical uh, protocol in a situation like this? It's typical protocol to not provide rail workers with safety equipment that they need on a day-to-day -day basis, much less in the case of an emergency. They, it, it was a fight throughout COVID to get any kind of sanitizing equipment. 
we can't we order through some bizarre online thing now for safety equipment which may or may not arrive if it does arrive it may be six months worth but yesterday or six it's been on back order for three months so you still don't have it and i i fundamentally believe that uh in their drive for profits and to clean up this black eye as quickly as they can to get the focus off them that the railroad probably did tell them hey, good enough make do make do that's what i think led to this it led to this derailment this policy of more with less get out there and do it get it done we don't have any tools for you well figure it out so yeah i i, I think it's very likely that they did something like that because it also fits in with their political agenda of claiming that the air is the air and water are clean yeah. uh, that they're they're safe they are not safe there's still dish popping up everywhere people are nauseated getting migraine headaches it's not safe I, it, it's absurd but it's all part of the narrative on the part of the ns and the other railroad companies to to say everything's fine after a major the crash that that poisoned this community and every other community downstream. Very disappointing. Um, one of the things I did notice a lot of the uh, the media the media coverage that I saw of this. First of all, mainstream media took a while to cover it. I think those of us in independent media covered it uh, first. But I noticed that there's a lot of people walking around with no protected no protection at all, no mask or anything. Like Aaron Brockovich is there. I don't know if you you heard about that. But uh, she went to visit East Palestine because she has experience dealing with these types of issues with chemical spills and environmental issues as well. But it was just really interesting to me, both her, Pete Buttigieg, several people walking around, no mask, no protective gear, anything like that. And to me, I'm just thinking like the chemicals are still in the air. Obviously, the water, they're claiming that the water is safe. I don't think it is uh, based on what I've heard from people who actually live in that area. But who do you think, and I'm going to pivot to you, Matt. Who do you think is responsible here? Do you think it's Norfolk Southern or do you feel like it's more so management in place that is to blame for this? What in particular, are you talking about the lack of, of personal protective equipment or are you talking about the incident as a whole? Both. Let's go with both. Well, let me start with the personal protective equipment. Let, let me step aside from east palestine for a minute and talk about an issue that we've had out out here where i'm at that's still ongoing to deal with and back to the devastating wildfire we had out here in the summer of 20, 2021 uh the railroads in the affected areas ran what they call fire trains they had these these tank cars with water in them uh, uh equipped with pump all this kind of stuff they put the on the track um allegedly to protect their uh, tracks, to protect their their structures and, and stuff like that, but they were actually out there. Additionally, you know, actively fighting fire on the track and, and fires. I listened to a story on night of two hundred and fifty. Oh. Now, I don't know if you ever heard the term nomad. Their shirts sure out of that material that are that are flame proof. Media personnel are not allowed on fire scene. They're not allowed anywhere close to a without no shirts, without with other type of gear. And had these railroad employees out there in these areas without any of this equipment whatsoever. It was recklessly irresponsible on the part of, of management. Management loved it because it made them look great. Uh, they were getting all press on that. Look what we're doing to help fight. But they put every one of those employees at grave risk and they continue to do so. And again, this is something they said we've talked about here in the we're going to have to um, address. How that relates to East Palestine, this is what you get when you're dealing with people who are coordinating a response or who are directing a response who have no idea what they're doing. And we're seeing some of this in, in the uh, uh, objections that the Pennsylvania governor has, has expressed regarding uh, Norfolk Southern's uh, actions in response to this, the fact that he's actually referred it to his attorney general for possible criminal charges and what they've done. Um, I have read, and, and I have some experience before I worked for the railroad, when, when I had a more predictable schedule and had time to participate in trains and stuff, in doing volunteer 
uh, work, not fighting fires, but support work for the fire on some of these wildfires out here in the West. And even though we were not assigned to fight fires and we were not even intended to be out in the fire area, just in the event that we found ourselves in an active burn area, the wildfire cooperators that we volunteered for required us to have, have certain certain equipment to participate in this activity. And oh, Matt, I think you're I think you're breaking up just a little bit, this, Matt. None of that training, none of that training. So, I mean, they don't even know what it is they should be doing. So, you know, and that's that's, that's the responsibility to the railroad. So. That's interesting. Um, Matt, I think you're breaking up just a little bit. Do you want to um, log off and log back in? Try that. Sometimes it helps, too, if you if you turn off your video. It's just the audio. Yeah. But Mary Lee, I, I want to pivot to put it back to you while uh, Matt does that. I want to go back to this video. I want to play a little bit more of this because uh, more information is coming out about this now. And I had a feeling this was going to happen, that other people were going to get sick, too, not just the people who live uh, in East Palestine. So I want to play a little bit more of this here. We're experiencing those um, symptoms on scene, but are they still weeks later still feeling those uh, symptoms? We are receiving reports that they are, and unfortunately, um, you know, when you you don't just it's not limited to just you on at the workplace. It's also uh, brought home with you to your family. So we're concerned about the families of those folks as well, and uh, we hope that um, we hope that there are no residual uh, effects from this. But it's hard to believe that there wouldn't be, considering the you know the contaminants that they were exposed to. So you say that uh, Norfolk Southern did not provide the protective equipment. Uh, we've reached out, as I said, and have not gotten comment from the company. Have you reached out? Have you had any communication with Norfolk Southern about that element specifically? We did. Uh, as soon as I found out, we had an immediate safety stand down. Um, they just simply told us that they were going to investigate the matter. They did seem concerned and they did seem like they wanted to figure out if there uh, really was, you know, what we were saying was true. They should have already known this. They didn't deny what happened, what we said happened what was reported to us, not by one, not by two, but, you know, 30 or 40 members that had told us this was, you know, what was going on. So the reports that we provided to them, they simply stated uh, that they were going to review them and go out to the scene and talk to the folks. Um, I don't think that's been done. I would hope that they would do this in a more timely manner. Uh, it's important that our, our members are protected, and I do believe that they were exposed, uh, exposed in a way they shouldn't have been. Um, do you believe, and I'll start with you, Mary Lee, do you believe that the railroad workers that are experiencing symptoms from this incident in East Palestine, do you believe they're going to be awarded any type of like compensation or, or anything or, or even paid time off, so to speak? I couldn't really venture to guess on that. Uh, it would depend on if they filed a, a injury on the job report. Um, okay. Of course, anybody that files an injury on the job, that's been one of our fights over the many, many years, is that we are often victimized for having reported unsafe conditions or having reported a personal injury as a result of their unsafe conditions. Oftentimes that can lead uh, to at least discipline against the individual worker and in the most extreme uh, reaction by the railroads to an injury report, dismissal on the street. So I think that while uh, there might be still quite a bit of hesitance to even report uh, thoroughly what has happened to you uh, in terms of on-the-job on injuries, that it's quite likely that, they, that the workers who are working in the concentration of the chemicals, which is what it, they're concentrated right there where the chemicals were released, in terms of the ground, the soil, that of course it's quite likely that they'll react to it in the same way that many citizens of East Palestine reacted, which is by getting sick, that they report the, the same things. So of course the rail it's in the railroad's interest to mitigate any claims from the residents of East Palestine, as well as any railroad worker who has been adversely affected by the by the chemicals involved in the derailment and and oftentimes are forced to work without proper equipment. Mm. Uh, to protect themselves. So I, I think we'll have to see if, if as the as people like you bring, 
just keep sounding the alarm as to what's going on in the railroad industry in this country uh, in terms of the rail workers, but also in terms of our communities that we live and work in, uh, the, the harder it is for the railroad to retaliate against workers. So it, it, we'll see how it all pans out. But I, I personally have felt the, the incredible victimization for reporting an injury. It's, it, mm. There is big pressure. They sent the terminal superintendent to my private doctor to meet me as I went to get medical care. This, these, are, uh, these are tactics that are used routinely by the railroads. And the threat always is over our heads of being victimized. Were we to take time off, for example, sick time, since we're not allowed that anyway, by and yeah. large, to even be off, I, the railroad now has another handle. They claim as a, they can claim as unrelated to retaliation. It's just coincidental that oh, you took too many days off. You hit your threshold. Now we're going to institute discipline. I've never seen transparency on the part of a single Class One railroad, or honesty for that matter, in in the courts or in the press conferences that take to explain what they're doing, how they're responding, uh, and to be clear, clear answers, not just, oh, no, we would never do that or whatever spin they put on it. But they have not. Transparency has never been their fort. It's, yes. it's just kind of the opposite. Yeah, I did notice uh, when they had the first town hall, I noticed Norfolk Southern didn't even show. And I know the residents were really <laughs> upset, Re really, really upset about that. And I wonder, too, in reference to because it wasn't just this incident, like after this incident happened, there was another derailment in yes. Texas. There was one in South Carolina. There was one in Arizona. And so a lot of us that have not worked in the railroad industry, we're sitting back and we're like, what is happening here? Like, is is that normal uh, to to each of you, is it normal to have multiple derailments one after another within like the same two weeks? I can't really say what's normal or not. There, there are probably, I think that the, the last thing I read was there are 1,200 derailments in the country per year is the average. So obviously more year, some years there are more and other years not. Uh, does this speak volumes that we're even having this many? Yes. Even how even twelve hundred a year, a thousand a year, eight hundred a year—that's too many, and most of them are preventable with with a, a a monetary and political and willful attitude towards really promoting, uh, allowing uh, the workers to promote safety on the job. So that's what we're still kind of stuck in we haven't been able to make that leap forward. And I just want to add, Michigan's another state that had a derailment in the last two weeks. Ohio had a second one, and that follows an, a, a derailment in Ohio in, near Sandusky, which is on the Lake Erie, uh, which is still in October of last year, which is still not cleaned up. The rail, NS has still not cleaned up the, the wreck from October. There was a road that was just recently opened, and there's still roads that are closed as a result of that derailment. So, so I think that railroads are kind of like the elf on a shelf. If they're looking at you, you're gonna try. You're gonna throw a few pennies this way or that way. If the if the shell if the elf is somewhere else and not you know doing Santa's job, or I never even had this as a kid, but <laughs> I, then you know then you're. You're, you're nicely dressed and no bad words slip out of your mouth when you're waiting on Santa. It's, it, it's the same kind of thing. When the focus of attention is on NS, well, they're going to try to do things a little better as well as deny what their standard operating practices are. But I, I wanted to point out that recently, I, I, I can't remember the source, but uh, there, were, they, there were tapes that were made. Uh, I believe it was on the UP, and I can't even give you the state, where now it's a big uh, expose that uh, the bosses were caught on tape being uh, uh, recorded telling Carmen, oh, we can't afford to do this. we got to move these cars out, get those cars out. We're not doing any bad bearings today. And that kind of pressure is what exists in every, virtually every workplace 
on the railroad in this country. And it's been going on for years. Improper brake tests, no brake tests at all. The federal government allowing railroads to run trains for a thousand miles without a complete air test on, on cycle trains, they call them long distance trains. There, there are a number of, of, it's all very murky as you get into the regulations. It comes, it come to find out the federal government doesn't regulate the hot box detectors that were, that went off as they were derailing, one did, and one 20 miles before that made no gave no audible warning but showed an elevated uh temperature on the bearing those are not even regulated by the federal government they allow the railroads to decide what is the heat at which a bearing will fail and it's not a subjective question it's a pretty objective question but the railroads have the subjective power to say well we'll set ours as 280 or we'll set ours at 156. And therefore, this car went by at least two detectors that where it was showing an increase in, in the in the not not just an increase in the heat, but an increase in the rate of the heat. So it went from heating up gradually to heating up very rapidly. And the detector 20 miles before should have said, whoa, 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 stop. We got a deal. But that, of course, once again, would interfere with the railroads all of the, the class ones, their fight for nothing but pure profit. Profit over the lives, health, and safety of not only the rail workers on the rails, but the workers and farmers and, and families in our communities, in the communities that we traverse, it, it just all across this country, from east to west, north to south. So that's what I think our real thing is that we're facing and how to organize our own response as working people against this. Because we already see, we see that the government doesn't even regulate something as important as that, yeah. as, as hot, box, hot box detectors. Uh, I think that I'd like to see the records on that car for the last six months. I'll just say that. I just want to see them. I just want to see them. I was on, I worked on the railroad and through freight operations primarily for over 30 years, well over 30 years. And I've never seen a, a car go from zero to explosion, basically. The wheel basically explodes. It seizes up and it just seizes mm -hmm. up, won't, won't turn, and then it wrenches off. I've never seen that happen in 40 miles. I've never seen it. I, I think it goes back to the other practices that NS workers and other carmen, the people who inspect the cars, are reporting. They're told to let the bearings go if if they're even if they're leaking. Leaking means that they're supposed to be closed bearings, not supposed to leak. Leaking is bad. It's like you move your car, there's oh my, there's a puddle of oil. Well, you don't have to be a mechanic to say, oh, oh this is not good. Right. Well, the same thing, only much more critically, is the question of the, the wheel bearing. And if you're being forced to, to work quicker because the railroad won't maintain staffing levels, so what used to take five or six minutes to uh, thoroughly inspect a car prior to its departure, you're doing it in 90 seconds because otherwise you'll be fired, you'll be on the street. It's all part of the same uh, culture of PSR, uh, precision scheduled railroading, they call it, which, of course, is none of the above. But it's part is of this the same. Oh, real quick. Is this the same type of when you say wheel bearing? Is this the same type of wheel bearing that's on your car? Basically, yes. OK, basically, yes. On the, when your front bearing goes out on a car you can't steer it that's like the big thing it starts mm -hmm. to go bad get it replaced because you're in a world of hurt at 70 miles an hour well imagine 9500 feet more of your car and 17,000 more tons behind you and that bearing goes out on a wheel the the in-train forces just simple physics the laws of motion are exponential at that point when you're going 50 mile 47 i believe it was miles an hour, and suddenly a wheel is wrenched because the the bearing uh, overheated and seized. And and 
uh, it's on the axle, it took the axle off basically. And then everything else hit from behind. So yeah, it's very much like it. It's not different. Although there are more bearings per car than the uh, rail car than you would have, of course, on, on your automobile. Mm-hmm. But for a, a regular person can clearly understand what kind of situation occurred. And they would also know that if you you would if you're driving a car and the bearing the front bearing is going out, you know, because it ain't acting right. There's something wrong. Even if you're not a mechanic, it's something wrong. It smells, mm-hmm. whatever. So all the things that could have been done to prevent this kind of thing, I think, are uh, show us the shady practices of all the class one railroads who have adopted the same business model of suck every cent out of the railroad and consequences be damned because we'll deal with those later. It's cheaper to pay for this derailment than it is to operate a safe railroad system. That's the sad truth. in in my opinion, it's cheaper to Mm -hmm. to just chase the money. And that's what they're doing with no regard for human life, human health, or the livelihoods. I feel for these people. I was born in in Ohio. Not too many people know that. I I don't like wave a Buckeye or something. I'm not, I'm not (laughs) like, but it, 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 I understand the, the the smaller towns because as a, as a child, of course, I visited many of them, family and stuff. So I I feel for them in my soul because they lost not just their trust, that not just their trust in the government, their trust that these corporations will do what they say they do and operate safely, but they lost their livelihoods. And who is going to, and from all around, who is going to buy crops? From mm-hmm. any area that's fed by that water. I mean, it, it, there's just, are, who's going to be able to sell their house? So they, you sink all this money, you spend your whole life working. You see a lot of these people on uh, television. And the the house is now uh, loan, or loan-wise or equity-wise or whatever underwater. It, yep. The property values are just overnight sunk. And I, I, I think it's 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 unconscionable what the railroad has done. It's unthinkable that they should not be charged criminally for the actions that they have done. I'm talking about the executives and the chief executive officer of the NF. Criminal charges should be at least uh, considered across this country for these kinds of, of actions that have gone unpunished now for decades, decades. So I'm, that- glad you, I'm glad you said decades, Mary Lee, because there's been a lot of uh, mainstream media pundits blaming this on. They said, oh, it's Donald Trump's fault. Some people say it's Obama's fault. But as you just mentioned, decades. So this has been an issue for a long time across administration. So people really need to People really need to understand that, that the safety concerns have been a problem. When do you remember, I'll pivot to you, Matt. When do you remember the railroad companies changing the rule to where, from what I understand now, there's only one person. They changed it from like two people to one person, like on the train, or they tried to reduce the staff. When do you remember that first happening when they started to reduce the staff? Staff reductions, I could I could tell you um, that I'm aware of. Uh, go back at least as far as 1985, because I was um, one of one of the union representatives who was at the head of passing a law here in Nevada that requires a minimum of two persons on on the crew of a train on on a class one or class two railroad. And in my research, uh, Nevada had previously had a law on the books requiring a crew uh, a minimum crew of five people. Uh, there were agreements made with with the unions at, at a time when the uh, railroad industry was was struggling financially back in the early 80s, and the unions actually sat down with the railroads and agreed that with technology and everything that they could safely reduce that that crew size. And in order to accommodate that, in Nevada, Nevada's law was repealed. It was a hell of a fight to get it back on the books. So again, I, I can tell you that this issue goes back at least that far in 1985. Um, what the unions never uh, expected when they were doing this and, and, and agreeing to crew size 
uh, reductions back in the 1980s is that we would get to the point where the railroads would actually push to get that down to one operator only in the cab of a locomotive. Um, it's not safe. It's not acceptable. It will not be efficient. And that's why uh, Nevada is, is one of the states now that has pushed and, and put these laws on the books. In, in the case of Nevada, put it back on the books. And why now you're seeing finally movement at the national level uh, to, to do this uh, nationally. So I hope everyone listening heard that going back to the eighties, because right now a lot of people are pointing fingers at, at one party, the other party, but, or excuse me, one, either Trump or Obama or whatever, but this is going back. Matt remembers going all the way back to the 1980s. I have a clip here. I want to show you now. This is uh, Pete Buttigieg. He has received a lot of criticism, uh, as you can imagine, because he's the secretary of transportation. And some people feel like he did not respond in a timely manner. They're like, where have you been? Uh, this kind of statement. Uh, he's going to discuss here about the possibility about fining the railroad companies. So I just want to play this clip here and I want to get your take on this. Mr. Secretary, as you just pointed out, uh, there are a number of high hazard trains on the rails in this country. And there have been toxic chemical spills around East Palestine prior to this one in that county and other places in Ohio and certainly around the country. But when you get into talking about why this happened, and even though it's called 100% preventable by the chairman of the NTSB, when you get into talking about that, the, the, the talk tends to make the railroad lobbyists sound like the equals of the gun lobby, that nothing can be done because they're so powerful. One of the aspects that you mentioned is fines for the railroad. What, how are the fines set? What would this company be, have, to, have to be paid, have to pay as a fine, given they make millions of dollars? And what can be done to hike the fine up that it's mind-bogglingly high? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, again, I can't speak to the findings that are still coming back from the investigation of this incident uh, and whether a violation is going to be found there. But what I will say is that when a violation is found, there is this uh, statutory uh, limit on on the, the fines that we can assess. And uh, I think that they need to be much tougher. The, the legislation uh, that's uh, been put forward in the Senate is one example of a way to do that. Uh, I think it pegs it to one uh, percent uh, of, uh, of the company's income. And uh, that's something that uh, would be more likely to get their attention than uh, $225,000 or so, uh, which is the legal maximum, even in a case that results in a fatality. Now, again, I, I do want to say that and there is other work being done on the EPA side to hold them accountable for the cleanup. That's already happening, and they're they're already paying for that. And by the way, that's an example of why we need a strong EPA. So uh, a lot of the same voices uh, uh, who have been uh, quick to get onto this issue were trying to dismantle the EPA just uh, a couple of uh, three years ago. Uh, and now we're seeing an example of how the EPA is uh, delivering accountability and helping to make sure uh, that Norfolk Southern cleans up the mess that it made. But here on the transportation policy, side, uh, whether we're talking about fines, whether we're talking about standards, uh, whether we're talking about technology, there is clearly more to be done. And, uh, you know, the, the power of the railroad uh, lobby is enormous. I've, uh, I've seen it for myself. Uh, you know, there was a rule having to do with breaking. Again, I'm not going to make any claims about uh, how that might have applied in this case. But there was a rule about breaking that, that was put in under the Obama administration in 2015. Uh, there were five lawsuits in different jurisdictions to uh, to try to take it down, and uh, they went after Congress, and they went to this agency. And sure enough, uh, eventually that uh, that rule got stripped away. So that's just one example of the muscle that that railroad lobby can flex in this city. But I really believe there is a chance to have a change in direction right now. Okay. Uh, do you believe that Increasing the fines on the railroad company, in this case, Norfolk Southern, do you believe that increasing those fines would actually make the railroad company change some of these policies where they're going to go back and they're going to change the safety or improve the safety measures? Do you think that will actually make them act? Well, I'm in favor of increased fines. Make no mistake about it. But I, I would like to say that it would take Warren Buffett is the head of Berkshire Hathaway, and they own the BNSF. They made uh, how many billions last year? So to find any railroad, to find them uh, as a as a punitive measure, would be we're talking tens of millions. We're not talking 
uh, a million. We're talking tens of millions, tens of millions per, per violation. Now, I have been involved in, in fighting for safety on the rails for as long as I've been working on the rails. And one of the things that I did over the years was try to use the Federal Railroad Administration, the FRA, which is in the transportation section, which Buttigieg doesn't oversee directly, but that's part of his general stuff. And, and to get them to act, number one, almost takes an act on, an, on a particular safety issue, almost takes an act of Congress. And if you do do all that and present the fully uh, vetted civil case, basically, to the FRA to take, to fight the railroads, they, they sometimes do find them. The railroads turn around and pay pennies on the dollar. They pay pennies on the dollar. And the FRA feels like it, it's lucky to get that. It's all part of this mindset that, that money should equal power in the, in the resolution of the issues that affect us in this country. The, and the railroads put in 10, the, I saw some figures that were very low, 12 million from the NS over five or six years. I don't believe that for a minute. I do not believe that for a minute. But let's just say it is only that. They, then the lobbyists come in and the ones who maybe were just voted out of office on the Capitol Hill. Now they're lobbyists. Yep. So they come in and I was going to say a, a different phrase, but uh, whisper in the ear of, of these people. And of course, you can't just whisper in their ear in a dark alley. You got to take them to dinner and you got to get good wine or whatever else. So there's all of this dirty money going on. And then there's the direct intervention for decades now of the railroad in trying to not just politically convince, spin, lie, and everything else, but actually putting in millions of dollars, uh, whether it's just in lobbying or whether it's for someone who is, is very, who's running for office, who is very lax on, on supporting regulation for the railroad or anybody else. There's always somebody to grease their pockets and they are, and they have gotten a blind eye turn now for many, many years, many, many years. And we continue to die on the rails. We continue to get injured on the rails. Our communities continue to get poisoned. Our, our, our brothers and sisters, and it's not just East Palestine, but on every rail line in this country. Mm -hmm. They are not held. The railroads are not held to a standard. They're just simply not held to any real standard. The break rule that you discussed uh, is one thing that, that would help. It's called electronically uh, controlled pneumatic brakes. It's a change in a 150-year-old brake system that we use, over 150, where brakes apply on each car. That is not something that could be implemented tomorrow, but the process of getting it done could be implemented tomorrow. But there are immediate actions that we should take, the length of the train, the tonnage of the train. Putting and making an emergency order here and now, there will be no train run without a minimum of two people. It's called an emergency order. The FRA puts them out all the time. They put them out on us about cell phone usage after the, the uh, wreck in California between a commuter train and a freight uh, where, where it was alleged, and I, I have no reason to, to speak one way or the other, but it was alleged and accepted that the, the one person was suicidal or whatever he was texting and, and uh, running a passenger train, which is uh, no engineer would defend any action like that. We that, that's absolutely, if I had been on the train and I wasn't the engineer, I think I would have put him out of the seat and ran it myself rather than see that happening. That's a whole nother issue. But after that, the FRA put out an emergency order, no cell phones in use unless, uh, with all these things, it happened, I bet, lickety split. There's no reason we cannot have emergency orders right here, right now, to begin to address these questions. Stop it with no more two mile long trains. Uh, I believe it was 2008, the average train, or maybe it was 10 years ago. I, I've read so many st statistics that kind of get stuck in my head. But the, the, 
I sort of lost my train of thought with that. That's okay. Yeah, I was going to ask them. I'll, I'll pivot to Matt really quick. Um, I've lived in apartment complexes that, for whatever reason, always had like a, a railroad track behind them. I don't know why, but these <laughs> things happened. And it was usually the freight trains that came through, sometimes like three o'clock in the morning, every time you could hear the here comes that train. And it made me wonder when this incident happened, what would have happened if that railroad would have been just an inch closer to the residents' homes in, in East Palestine when that train derailed? And, and that's what I'm thinking about. Like, what if that railroad was closer? And just think about other things that could have happened. Like, it could have ruined, people could have been, like, physically killed. And I just feel like it seems like our government really is not thinking about that, so to speak. And, and one of the issues that has come up, and I want to play uh, this clip here, people have drawn attention to the fact that the president is nowhere to be found. And, and multiple people have come. So I told you, so Tulsi Gabbard has been there. Uh, Aaron Brockovich has been there. Pete got there eventually, but other people made it there before he did. And he's the secretary of transportation. And then in this clip here, case study QB. Oh, case didn't get this one. But in this clip here, Don Lemon actually asked uh, Pete Buttigieg about whether or not President Biden should come to East Palestine. And I want you to hear uh, this response here because... I think this is this is very telling. Now that you have been to East Palestine, you've seen the devastation firsthand. It's his decision ultimately. But I have to ask you, do you think that the president, President Biden, should visit and speak with families there? Well, what I know is he's been concerned about this, about uh, what the people are going through. Uh, I think also a, a visit of that level can uh, uh, can sometimes uh, have a, a lot of disruptive effects, so it would need to be thought of carefully. But I'm certainly glad that I went. Now that you have been to East Palestine, you've So yeah, so basically he said that he thinks that by the president coming that it's actually going to be disruptive. And, and this is just shocking to me because we have to think back to the fact that Obama went to Flint late. He got there late. But he, he eventually went there. And Donald Trump, who's not even president anymore, went to East Palestine. Now, first of all, is it East? Is it Palestine or Palestine? Because everybody pronounces it differently. I'm well, going to ask you, Mary Lee. The, the residents of, of, the, of the town call it East Palestine. Okay. East Palestine with a, a different sound to the eye. Of course, everybody who's, who reads World News, their tongue automatically says Palestine. But it's like many other uh, Uvalde, Texas. Nobody knew how to say that forever but because it's a, not an English, uh, Anglo-Saxon type word. So anyway, it, they, that's how they call it. So that's why I, I use it. But most of the time, I, I will slip into calling it Palestine myself. But that's how they say it is East Palestine. And that the least I can do is, get their, <laughs> is try to get their name right with the, all the suffering that has been inflicted on these uh, these brothers and sisters mm -hmm. from another, another town. Does it concern you? And I'll, I'll ask you, Matt, does it concern you that the president has not made a, a visit to East Palestine, Ohio? I, I think when it comes to presidents visiting things like this, um, you know, it's, it's largely political. It's, it's, um, you know, it's it's making an appearance, just, just like you said, is, does the president make an appearance? That's what it is. It's making an appearance. What the effect of that has, uh, I think it doesn't directly have an effect on the incident itself, but sometimes maybe that 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 is reassuring to people. And it gives the uh, it, it gives the uh, impression that the president cares. Uh, looking back to, I believe, Oh, I can't remember what year it was right off hand now, but one October here in Nevada, the shooting incident that took place at the concert in Las Vegas. President Trump came out and visited victims of that. Uh, again, did it have any kind of, of lasting effect on, on what the outcome was? No, but it showed that he cared and it showed that, you know, it, 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 it was reassuring to people. Um, so should the president go to, go to some place like that? I, I think largely that, co that question is a political one. Uh, perhaps maybe being on the ground and standing in there might give him a different perspective on how serious this is and actions that are needed. Um, so, so I think that's kind of subjective as to, as to how you view it. Um, 
as far as the comment of it being disruptive, I really don't see it as being disruptive. Right. Um, but, but, you know, in terms of what it will accomplish, you know, is, is it going to accomplish much other than, other than perhaps uh, reassuring people and, and maybe giving the president a different perspective, seeing it firsthand? I don't know. What about you, Mary Lee? Do you think he should visit? Well, I think disruptive, uh, that, that any disruption Biden would cause by visit is a drop of water in the ocean compared to the disruption in the lives of the people of East Palestine. So I, 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 think that, I think that Biden needs to come out on this clearly and openly on the side of the citizens of East Palestine. And by that, I mean Biden should be standing up, speaking that he heard us on September 15th, all over 100,000 of us that wanted to go on strike over these central issues, including safe operation of the railroads. He could stand up and say, Norfolk Southern will, will be fully examined. We demand transparency from them and all the other railroads. He could actually say something that would put pressure on the railroads uh, to, to be responsible, put pressure on the government and his own agencies within his administration, insisting that the railroad be held accountable, NS be held accountable, that the other railroads be held accountable for their intransigent fight against uh, the the health and safety of not only the workers but of of all of these communities and to fight for these to implement these real uh safety pr proposals like length of train maximums minimum crew staffing a minimum amount that the of uh, of uh accountability would be like a gazillion fold as to what it is now. So I think that is that is the main thing. Uh, not just being there, not being there. Uh, I mean, that's, it would have made more sense to show up, I would think. Mm -hmm. By the same token, I think that we have to understand that politicians are not real quick to jump on the side of what's right till they lick their finger and put it in the air to try to figure out which way the wind is blowing. I think they're very surprised to find that the wind was not only blowing a certain direction, but it was blowing real hard. Mm -hmm. And it's going to keep blowing real hard until the American people get some answers, get some clarity not how this happened, how we are going to prevent it in the future, although I have ideas on all those, and a, and a firm commitment from the Biden administration and and both of the major electoral parties, Democrats and the Republicans, that they will stay, they will force the the railroads to stand down on this attack on those who work on the rails, and the implicit attack of of uh, poisoning a community. That he will stand hmm. on the side of the. He wants to talk about being the common Joe, the common man. Stand up on vocally, critically. And honestly, on the side of the common person who has been totally uh, beaten back by these railroads for decades now with a sharp, sharp pivot into uh, downward, a vortex, more of a vortex downward in the last 10 years. Yeah. So that's what, that's what faces us. What are we going to actually convince uh, people to do and what we're going to demand. And just about now, I'm, I'm pretty sick to death of hearing about how much they care and from everyone, from the uh, Trump to everybody except uh, uh, Aaron, Bro I can't say her name. The, Aaron uh, Brockovich. Brockovich, yes, except for her. And I, she's, she, because she has a history because she yeah. fights, because what, you, what comes out of her mouth is based on what her feet have done, her feet yep. in the struggle have done. And that's, I just want to say one final thing. We don't need any more experts. We certainly need all the facts to come out. 
but we have 100,000 experts on how to run a railroad, working on the railroad today. Not equally everyone with a view toward this or that, but who understand what is going on, who understand what needs to be done, and, and are beginning to step forward and demand that, that these things do occur, that safe operations, uh, that we, we tilt the camera, we tilt the focus away from the maximum profit for the hedge funds and the other owners of the railroad and turn the spotlight back toward uh, navigating our way into a safe rail transportation system that is regulated, that does not, uh, that cannot and does not seek to do nothing but extract profit at the expense of, of every other single thing. It enriches the point one one tenth of one percent of the of the extraordinarily obscenely rich in this country, and the rest of us deal with the chem the the chemicals, the implosion, and we need to begin to turn that around. And I'd be interested. I'm interested. I I keep watching what both parties are saying, but. I'm not impressed, mm -hmm. and I certainly haven't seen anybody that has not across the board any single person, but the answer is isn't worth studying. Talk it's is action. cheap, and actions speak louder than words. That's right. That's right. Do you think there's any, if given the opportunity, would either of you like to nationalize the railroads? And I ask that question because it has been pointed out to me that even Norfolk Southern, they have corporate there's corporate connections there. Black Rock's connected to North, uh, Northern, the Norfolk Southern, uh, as well as uh, other industries as well. If you had, if you were given the opportunity, would you vote to nationalize the railroad system? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, today. In fact, I hope that I, I, along with not just Matt, but thousands of other workers, together we can convince the overwhelming majority of Americans to support that because we know that we cannot rely on, on the owners of these railroads to operate the railroads safely, to operate the railroads in the interest of the farmers the, the, who have to move their grain for the other, in particular, to my mind, smaller shippers who cannot get their goods moved. The railroads can be, they have the potential to be the safest method of transport of dangerous chemicals. And the fact is that there's nobody, I think, who looks at it in this country who thinks that we don't need different chemicals. What they are and stuff is really for somebody else to take on. But, but yes, the only way that we can organize the rail to be safe and productive and meet the needs of, the pa of, of potential passengers we should have passenger rail, for God's sake. The only industrialized country in the world, basically, that, that has Amtrak instead mm -hmm. of, of, a, of a true national rail where you can get from Chicago to the West Coast in less than three days. Yeah. So there, there are a lot of things that could be used to serve the interests of the vast majority of this country, which is those who live in live and work in these communities. It is not the one-tenth of one percent who are in it to suck out every last cent at the expense of all of us. And this is what we've seen in, in the East Palestine events, not just the crash, but the ongoing events. And I, I just yeah. say that I want, yeah, Matt, I was just gonna say, Matt, I wanted to hear you. The, the 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 largest contributing factor to to any of the problems on the rail system these days, whether it be service issues, whether it be safety, anything, is the monopoly power that these companies have gained through mergers and acquisition. And the quickest and, and most assured way of fixing it would be nationalization. Every other mode of transportation uses some form of public infrastructure, highways, our ports are owned by government entities, uh, our, our public uh, uh, infrastructure, our airports, all that except for the railroads. And the railroads love to tout how, you know, they, they are privately maintained, that they put their own capital into it and everything.
but when you neglect it, as they have been doing under under PSR, and uh, abuse the system and abuse your monopoly power to where you're not providing, you're, you're doing the, a disservice to the American public, then it's something needs to change. And and this has been the focus of a lot of these hearings at the Surface Transportation Board. Um, everybody except maybe the railroads recognizes that that we need to get uh, increase a competitive environment there uh, in order to improve service and, and keep rates low and everything. But it, it never happens because of the monopoly power these companies have. And again, as I said, nationalization of, of the infrastructure would fix that. Well said. Well said. Well, I want to thank both of you so much for coming back on. Um, it's really interesting to me. Like I said, I, I feel like this is karma in a sense because – both of you and other railroad employees have tried to make your voices heard. Last year, when you tried to explain to people that there are safety issues with the railroads, that they were uh, decreasing the number of workers, that it was more about profit, that they weren't giving people sick or paid sick days. Like you tried to explain this to people. And I do feel like this incident that happened in East Palestine, Ohio, I feel like this is kind of like karma uh, to Congress because they, they really weren't, I don't want to say they weren't acting like they cared. They just, they didn't see it as a sense of urgency. And that's unfortunate. And this is the result. There will be more. Yep. There will be, uh, we, they were very fortunate, not the people of East Palestine, of course, or people uh, down river, but w this could have been New York City. This could have been Northern New Jersey. This could have been Chicago, which is the biggest rail hub in the country. This could have been a highly populated, dense uh, area with, and it could have been worse. It could have been crude oil or some other highly volatile, more explosive uh, chemical or, or oil or volatile things. It could have been far worse. And they have, one, and, one there more thing. Be, and there won't be anything to not to prevent something far worse from happening if we continue business as usual and we don't immediately hold both the owners of the railroads and the government agencies that are responsible for regulating, holding both their feet to the fire to make uh, at least some beginning initial strides to, uh, to prevent the same thing from happening over and over. Sabrina, you talked about, you know, uh, if, if those railroad tracks had been a foot closer, um, you know, this is, this is a talking point that I've used very frequently with some of our lawmakers that uh, rail safety, railroad accidents maybe tend to um, not get the attention they do uh, or, or they should because they're not as spectacular uh, perhaps as an airplane dropping out of the sky. And what, I, and what I say is, you know, trains typically don't drop out of the sky. But on occasion, we do send some carloads of some really nasty stuff rocketing into nearby neighborhoods when things go really wrong. Um, and, and one thing for your viewers here to be aware of as you talk about this, the, the initial isolation distance for a chlorine tank car that's breached at night is, is seven to eight miles. So you may not live anywhere near close to the tracks and you may not routinely hear the trains going through and therefore you don't think you're at risk. But you don't realize that, that this stuff can reach out and have effects over a very wide area. And it's a reason for, you know, people to be concerned about that. Just because you don't live right next to a railroad track or something doesn't mean that a future accident involving some of this stuff isn't going to affect you. That's right. Well said, Matt. Well, thank both of you so much for coming back on and I'll keep my eyes like peered to this story and we'll see what happens from here. But I, I sincerely hope people in East Palestine get uh, the justice that they deserve. But thank you guys so much for coming on. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you for having us again, Sabrina. Bye. Bye. Bye.